Mary Hart had a difficult upbringing. She overcame a lot and she went on to be a nurse, served during the Vietnam War. Years later, she wrote a book, which is basically a story of her life to encourage others called Tough Lessons. And it's sad, but true. Many of the lessons that we learn in life are tough. Okay, so I'm talking to a room full of people who have it easy from the get-go and never had any problems. Some of the lessons in life we learn are tough. Yes. Tough lessons. And in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is going to speak to some of these. Matthew chapter 16, and starting in verse 21. At this point, Jesus is on the back end of his ministry. So as he begins to uh, get ready for the most significant event of his life. Um, he starts to prep the apostles. And so this is what he says, Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the son of man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his father. And then he'll repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the son of man coming in his kingdom. Now the first tough lesson is that we need to have focus in life. Look what he says in verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Now, I just want to make a point here. There are many who want to deny the Bible and the truth of the Bible. And one of the arguments is that Jesus never claimed to be God, which is completely false. Jesus said before Abraham was, I am, which is a clear connection with God's self-revelation in Exodus chapter three. In addition, Pilate said, are you the son of God? And Jesus said, you have said. Uh, and so a second one is that Jesus never predicted that he would die and rise again. Clearly they haven't read the Bible. It's right here, Jesus predicts it. Now, those who don't believe the Bible, this is what they'll say. Well, yeah, that doesn't count because that was added by the early church. Well, then you can't win. Like he didn't predict it. Well, yeah, he did. Well, no, that one doesn't count. So you discount all the ones that show they did predict it. Jesus did predict his death and resurrection because we do believe the Bible because it is God's inspired word. Yes. And so Jesus began to tell them that he's going to die and to rise again. Now, <clears throat> we need to grasp who these apostles are and the significance of what Jesus just said to them. They came from a variety of backgrounds. A couple of them had been paramilitary kind of guys. Matthew was a tax collector. A number of them were fishermen. All of them had left their profession. All of them had left their careers. They left all that behind in order to follow Jesus. They have followed him now for three years. Jesus says to them, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. What he just said to them was, are you going to be back on your own again? These guys are thinking, oh, wait a second. I didn't sign up to follow you for three years and then it not go according to plan. Yeah. I'm just curious, have any of you ever had a time in your life when things didn't go according to plan? Okay, so we can all identify with the disciples here. Like, wait a minute, this is not what, what, we, what we thought we were getting was the Messiah. And the Messiah is supposed to overthrow Rome, liberate us from the Roman Empire, reestablish the kingdom of David. That's what we signed up for. That's why we're following you. That's what you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to die. That's not what we planned on. And so... Peter, the spokesman, says what all of them were thinking. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. You can't die. You've got to get rid of the Romans. So Jesus turns to him and in a moment of gentleness and compassion says, Get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me. You're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Now, I'll be honest with you. 
I've called people lots of things over the years. Friend, brother, I, people hang around and say, I don't know why, just for years, I just call lots of people babe. I, I don't know, just, hey, you're next babe or whatever, just like in line, I just I don't know. And I may have called someone Satan behind closed doors. But I've never to someone's face said, get behind me, Satan. But Jesus does. Now, why does he do that? Because Peter is being used by Satan to attempt to hinder God's plan. I don't know about you, that, that, that concerns me. To think that someone who is a disciple of Jesus could still be used by our enemy. And so he says, get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance. Now here's the purpose. Here's the lesson to be learned. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. You, you need to, to focus on the things of God. Because if we don't focus on the things of God, we get distracted by all the other stuff. Okay. So the tough lesson for you and me is with all the distractions, we need to keep focused on Jesus. Now, the mind is a fascinating thing. I don't understand it. Don't know much about it. Didn't study that sort of stuff in school. But the mind is still, it's, it's incredible what focus of mind can do and can achieve. Now, I need you to look at me to understand the way I want to explain this. Okay. I am not white. I'm pale. That's like a shade past white. I mean, I just, I'm pale. Now, when you look like this, you're very susceptible to sun damage. And because as a teenager, I spent all my free time on the lake when we used to use suntan lotion instead of sunscreen, I've done a lot of damage to my skin. Now, I'm very careful now, but in some ways it, it's too late. Some of the damage has been done. So I have to go to the skin doctor at least twice a year. And my goal every time I go, my prayer is that there'll be three or few, fewer spots they have to burn off. And so I've had stuff burned and cut and all kind of, it's just, it's just, a, it's just part of being pale. There's nothing I can do about it. And that's just how it is. <clears throat> well, a couple of years ago, my doctor said, hey, there's this new kind of treatment we want to do. It's blue light treatment. I think well, Kmart special. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a blue light. So, so here's what they do. Basically, they put your head inside of this giant thing and it, puts concentrated blue light rays and it basically is supposed to burn all this stuff off. And so I'm like, okay, so we scheduled the day and I get there and, and uh, there are a couple of assistants there working. They said, okay, now we're going to put your head in here for 15 minutes and 26 seconds. That scared me to death. It isn't like we're going to put it in there for around 15 minutes. They got like down to the second. Like I'm thinking, what happens if we get to 15 minutes and 27 seconds? Does my face melt off? I mean, I'm like, you know, when they get it like to the second. So I'm like, okay, so we're going to put it in there. And uh, now most people don't get the whole time. They, they need to take a break because it, it hurts. It feels like your face is burning. And so when it gets, it's uncomfortable to say something and we'll, we'll stop it and then we'll give you a break and some wet claws and then we'll go back and finish. I'm thinking, you better hit the pause just right on that 1526. You with me? I mean, I'm like, and so they put the cucumber, th I know that cucumber, but the little spongy thing in my jiggers on my eyes, you know, cause you know, you damage your eyes and they get them all taped in and they put my head down in there and they said, oh, okay, now here we go. Now, for those of you who, are more relaxed in your approach to life. 15 minutes, not that big a deal. But for those of us who run on high octane, I mean, we, we don't, 15 minutes is an eternity. I'm thinking that's 15 minutes of my life wasted. And if I have to take a couple five minutes breaks, that's like 25 minutes of my life wasted. Uh-uh, I'm sitting in this thing for the whole 15, 26. I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna get it over with. That's just sort of my personality. And so I'm thinking, all right, what, what am I going to do? You can't read because they got the thingies on your eyes. I can't read, can't watch TV. So I get in there and you know what I'm waiting for? Elevator music, like that's going to make it better. But there was none of that. There's just, basically there's silence. So I thought, all right, what am I going to do? I thought, okay, if I don't want to feel the, the pain on my face, if I can focus my mind on something else, then maybe I won't feel what they're, they're burning me. So it's obvious I'm a mountain biker. 
So I just picked a trail and in my brain, in my mind, I'm picturing myself hitting the drops, doing the climbs, going through the roller coaster. And I'm just carving this trail, I'm going along. And then as I'm on this trail in my mind, just totally absorbed with it, I hear a voice from heaven. It's a female voice, but God can talk with any voice he wants. And the voice says, are you okay in there? And I realize I'm not on the trail, I'm in the doctor's office. I'm like, yes, okay. So I'm back on the trail again. And then a few minutes later I hear, are you sure you're okay in there? Same voice from heaven, yes. Now back on the trail. And then I hear, okay, we're done. It's like, cool, I did the whole thing. I did the whole 15, 26. They said, wow, you did the whole thing. I said, yes. They said, do you hurt us? No, not at all. It really didn't hurt that much. My mind was so focused. Now later that day, holy cow, it was just like murder. And I looked in the mirror and it's just all peeling off. It was an awful experience. But during the 1526, when they told me it's hurt, I was able to, to not get distracted by the pain because I was so focused. The mind is an amazing thing when you can focus it. I don't understand how that works, but it's incredible. So notice what he says in this verse. The lesson that he wants us to learn, that we need to keep our mind focused. We need to set your mind on the things of God, not on the things of man. Because if all you see are the distractions, you're not going to stay focused on Jesus. But if you're focused on Jesus Christ, then the distractions are not going to take away from your following him. And so Jesus says, set your mind on the things of God, be focused on him. And then verse 24 says, we're going to follow. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, if anyone is going to be a follower of me. Now, the fact that he words it that way tells us that it is possible to not be a follower of Jesus. But if we are going to be a follower of him, he's gonna tell us how it's gonna look like. The word would is an interesting term. It means to desire. If you have a desire to follow me, then there are things that are going to not be in your life. See, here's the way that it works. If, when we look at desires, oftentimes they compete with one another. And so we have to select the desire that is going to be the greatest one in our life. And when that's the greatest desire, then the, then the other one we have to let go. Let me just give you just an obvious, simple, but hopefully explanatory. A desire to not be way overweight and a desire to eat pie and chocolate and ice cream and fry. Come on now, I'm gonna keep going until I get some amens out here. These are conflicting desires, right? And so you're going to, one of them is going to be the desire that you follow. And the other one is out the window. So Jesus says, if you desire to follow me, and then he gives three pictures of what that looks like. The first picture is you'll take up your cross and follow me. Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Now, when we think of the cross, we think of something that we celebrate, that we glorify, and we should. The Bible says, I have decided I will glory in nothing but the cross of Jesus Christ. So it's, I think we should glorify the cross because it is in what Jesus did on the cross that we find forgiveness. But in the Roman world in which Jesus was speaking, the cross was not something that was glorified. It was horrible. It was the most painful death that they could possibly imagine. And it was humiliating. <clears throat> now, a typical person who was crucified took about three weeks to die. They were stunned that Jesus died so quickly. People didn't die quickly. Here's the way that it went. They would crucify you. And we think of the, like the cross way up high, but if you're gonna crucify somebody, how high off the ground they need to be? You know, an inch is as good as 10 feet. The higher up you put them, the more unstable it gets. So most people crucified basically at eye level, just, you know, an inch or two off the ground is all you needed. And families were even encouraged to feed and to bring water to the person who was being crucified. That way it would stretch out the pain. And so you could live two, three weeks before you died. What the Romans would do is they would actually line the roads coming into a town with people who were crucified. And they would put the crime of the person above uh, their head nailed on the cross. And so basically what they were saying was, if you break our laws, you're gonna join these people. I would say it was probably a pretty effective deterrent to crime in many cities. And so they, they would, they would, it was extremely painful, long, screaming, but not only that, it was humiliating. They would strip people completely naked. 
in order to humiliate them when they were out there. So look at what Jesus says. The first picture of desiring to follow him is that you're willing to give up your life even in a painful and humiliating way in order to follow him. There's a second picture that he uses of following him. Not only deny yourself, take up your cross. But verse 25, whoever would lo- save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now, what's he talking about here? Well, here's kind of the way that it works. There's your life and there's Jesus' life. Which one do you want? If you say, I want my life, then you don't have Jesus' life. But if you're willing to let go of your life and embrace Jesus' life, you have real life. So I ask you, whose life do you want? Yours or Christ's? Okay, we got six people ready to go with me to heaven. Do you want your life or do you want Christ's life? We have his life in us. Don't don't embrace your own life. Embrace Christ's life that we have. We have his life in us. And so if we're going to follow him, we want to embrace his life. And so we have to lose ours. We have to let ours go because if we embrace our life, then we're going to lose his and let it go. And then in verse 26, he gives a third picture. This time a monetary picture. What does it profit a man if he gains everything, the whole world and forfeits his soul? What shall a man give in return for his soul? What's the most important thing you have? It is your soul. What is the one thing you have that is eternal? It is your soul. So what does it profit you if you are chasing all these other things, but you lose your own soul? Now I wanna make sure we understand what Jesus is saying, and I wanna make sure you understand what I'm saying. When we talk about following Jesus to the exclusion of everything else, We're not saying that other pursuits are bad. There are some things that we pursue that are good and fine and even biblical. If a young man wants to pursue marriage, that is not a bad thing. Man, some of you need every point you can get and I just gave you a chance. So I'm gonna give you another chance here, all right? All right, guys. If a young man wants to pursue marriage, that's okay. It's not a bad thing. If you want to pursue a family, there's nothing wrong with that. To pursue a career. There are plenty of things that we pursue that are fine and good. Here's the problem. If any of those things become your ultimate pursuit, you're not following what you ought to. So when Jesus talks about what is the problem of gain the whole world, giving up your life, dying yourself, falling your cross. What, what Jesus is saying is it's not him or everything else. What he's saying is he is the ultimate pursuit of your life. And when Jesus is the ultimate pursuit of your life, you're following him above all else. That affects your marriage. That affects your family. That affects your career. It affects everything in your life because this is ultimately what you are pursuing. In 2012, I found an article It's written by David Miller for the Matador Network. This is what he said, it's what our lives are. It's being on the hill, said Sarah Burke on the Ski Channel's feature film, Winter. Sitting beside her husband, Roy Bushfield, she continued, it's amazing. It's where we met, where we play, where we live. As Rory finished and hopefully where we die. Almost by default, once someone, an athlete, adventurer, or even just an individual committed to a certain field like journalism, reaches a certain level, the separation between their work and their life disappears. While high profile athletes I've interviewed rarely, if ever, seem to think in terms of giving their lives to a sport, that seems more a notion constructed by those of us around them. There is, as hinted to in Sarah and Rory's words above, a sense that by virtue of who they are, they simply have no choice but to continue their progressions wherever and however dangerously they lead. Being on the hill is the only place they are truly themselves. Last month, Sarah Burke, the most storied female freestyle skier in history, died from injuries sustained in a superpipe training run. The story went on to honor 15 people who had died doing what they love. Now, while the article is not intended to point out anything biblical, there are a couple of statements that capture what Jesus is saying right here. Being on the hill is the only place they are truly themselves. Living in the life of Christ, following him is the only place you're truly free to be yourself. I like this statement, the separation between their work and their life disappears. The lesson Jesus is communicating to us here is this, following Jesus is not what we do, it is who we are. And so what he's saying, he's saying deny yourself and follow me. 
Lose your life so that you'll find it. And what does it profit to gain the whole world and lose your own soul? What Jesus is saying is we'll start down the journey of following him about what we're doing, but it should become so much a part of us that's no longer what we do, it's who we are. And sometimes that is a tough lesson to learn, but this is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. It is who we are, not just what we do. And then the next one that Jesus gives us, the tough lesson about finishing. Verse 27, the son of man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his father. Jesus Christ is coming again. Let me say that again. Jesus Christ is coming again. And he's coming with his angels in the glory of his father. Now that's awesome. I'm ready for Jesus to come back. I'm on board for when he comes back. And when he comes back, I am on board. (laughs) But notice what he says at the end of verse 27. And then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Now what does that mean? Well, that means that every single human being who has ever lived will be judged according to what they've done. That means that every single human being who has ever lived is going to be found guilty. Every single human being who's ever lived is going to fail to make it to heaven. You may think, well, I thought you Christians believed in hope. Yes, we do. Here's why. When Jesus died on the cross, as he predicted in this passage, Jesus had never done anything wrong. He had never committed any sin. He had never disobeyed God. He had no guilt of his own to pay for. So when Jesus died on the cross, instead of paying for his own guilt, he paid for my guilt. All of mine was taken off me and put onto him. All of his perfect life, all of his righteousness was put onto me, onto my account. So that when God sees me, when I am judged, I am going to be considered perfect. Not because of my righteousness, but because of the righteousness of the life of Jesus Christ that has been put on me. So here's how it goes. My stuff was dumped on Jesus and he died and his stuff was dumped on me so that I might live. And so the hope for us is that we will get through the judgment, not based on what we have done, but what Jesus has done that is credited to our account. And so Jesus is going to come and he's going to judge everyone. And those that have put their faith in him have his righteousness and will pass the judgment. Those who have rejected him will only have their own righteousness, which is not enough. And they will fail the judgment. Truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the king, the son of man coming in his kingdom. We're going to get a little glimpse, a little taste of what this son of man coming in his glory is going to be all about. Now, when Jesus says this, he's not saying there's going to be some apostle that's going to live for thousands of years. I realize that the Mormons believe that the apostle John is hidden in a cave somewhere and he's been alive for over 2000 years, which is rather humorous because they have 12 apostles, but actually he would make 13. (laughs) You'll get there eventually. It's just math. That's not what Jesus is saying. What he's saying is that one of you here some of you are actually going to be three of them are going to see what this glory is going to look like. And sure enough, in chapter 17, Jesus is going to reveal himself what's called the transfiguration. They're going to get a little glimpse, a little taste. You and I, as we read God's word, we get a little taste of what the finish is going to be like. And one of the toughest lessons in life to learn is to not think it's all about right now. There is a finish for us. I want to give you three big words. Justification, sanctification, glorification. Sanctification is what happens when we get saved. We put our faith in Jesus, we are justified. What that means is that our sin, the penalty for sin is paid for. The penalty of sin is removed. The penalty for my disobedience to God is gone. It was paid for by Jesus Christ on the cross. It was applied to me when I was justified, when I put my faith in Jesus Christ. So I have been saved by Jesus. That's justification. Sanctification is the follow part. It's the pursuing him. It's living for him. It is denying myself, taking up my cross. Sanctification is when there's stuff in my life I need to get rid of. We all love to hear someone tell the story about how there was a sin that just had a hold on them, had a grip on them and how Jesus has set them free. That's sanctification. So in other words, I was saved 
That was justification. I am being saved, that sanctification, from the power of sin. So justification, uh, the penalty of sin was removed. In sanctification, the power of sin is being removed. And someday I'm going to be glorified. And the presence of sin is going to be removed. I will spend forever with him in heaven. I am looking forward to that day when I will be given a body that won't wear out or burn out or rust out or anything else. I will be given one like the one Jesus had when he rose from the dead that is fit and designed and planned to last forever. That's going to be glorification. And so Jesus says, I want to give you a little glimpse of the future, a little taste, because someday it's going to become yours. When I was in school, I, I went to a couple of graduations. I saw friends of mine graduate. It was cool. I got to celebrate for them. I got to celebrate with them. It was pretty, pretty neat to watch them graduate. Do you know why? Because watching them graduate was kind of like an incentive for me. It, it was like a foretaste that one of these days I was going to graduate too. You do understand there's no such thing as an almost graduated diploma. <laughs> there, there's not a almost made it kind of graduation. Okay, that, that, that there is a, a, a graduation. Man, somebody ought to say amen right here. It's a good day. We see others and, and we celebrate, but it's a taste that, that someday it's going to be ours. There are many a time when we have attended a funeral and, and, and it was a taste, a reminder for us that they have already graduated and someday we are going to graduate and join with them as an alumnus and we are going to be gathered at the greatest alumni meeting there has ever been surrounding the throne of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We are looking for the finish that is ours and sometimes it's a tough lesson to realize that we want to stay the course to the end. Sometimes we think, man, the world is so bad. Is there any hope? And the answer is yes. The hope is in Jesus Christ. Jesus says, you need to focus on me. You need to follow me and you need to anticipate the future. And this whole thing is kind of like taking a kid into the store, give him a $5 bill. Now, you know how that goes. You give a kid $5 bill. It's, it's a rejoicing time, but it is also sheer torture. This is all you get. And so they go down to the, the little, you know, plastic toy aisle and they're looking at things. And man, it's a tough decision because there's only one $5 bill they get. What am I going to exchange this for? And, and they may think they have it. And then you get to the checkout line. And have you ever noticed that the candy bars are strategically placed at eye level for a child? Not by accident. And now the whole decision process comes again. What am I willing to exchange this for? Here's what Jesus is telling us in this passage. You and I have one life, one life, yes. and only one. There's no do-over. There's no other, you have one life. What are you going to give your life for? Yes. What are you going to exchange this life for? If you give your life for this life, you will have no life. But if you give this life, if you give your life for Jesus' life, you will have eternal life. I'd say it's a pretty good exchange. Whose life do you want? Your life or his life? Whose life do you want? Your life or his life? Whose life do you want? Someone else's or his life? His life. In him, we have life. And so what Jesus says is, look, this is a tough lesson, but you need to focus on me. Put, put your mind on the things of God. You need to follow me. Your desires to follow me, deny yourself and, and follow me. Take up your cross, lose your life for my life and keep your eyes on the fact that it is worth it because the finish is glorious. Jesus says, hey, look, it's a tough lesson, but it's a great lesson. I want to exchange this life for his life because his life is eternal life.